Hi, everyone. I'm Anthony Morrow. I'm Harley Silvaca, and this is Boom Direct, a show where we discuss our biggest hits, the insides of the comic book industry, first look announcements, and exclusive interviews with your favorite comic book creators, and more. Today, we are speaking to the two men whose account of the largest publicly known scientific investigation into one of the most active and notorious paranormal hotspots garnered national ten- attention with their best selling acclaimed book, Hunt for the Skinwalker. Dr. Colm Kelleher and George Knapp. Hi, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're very excited, so we're going to dive right in. I would love for you guys both to say what was the weirdest thing you witnessed while at the ranch? The first trip I made with a photographer, we drove in the property, and I swear we heard a wolf growling, a big growl, as soon as we entered the front gate. We looked at each other like, did you hear that? Was it real? But we didn't see anything. I have never seen anything that I would call anomalous other than a strange light in the middle uh, homestead that we could not identify. But none of the creatures, none of the flying saucers that other people have seen. I've been there a couple dozen times, column hundreds of times. So he has much better stories than I do. At the time, you know, a rancher and his wife were still working as ranch manager just after we had taken over the ranch. And he still had his cattle on the property. They were you know, they were on in the process of moving them off. And this was around March of 1997. And <clears throat> they were tagging these newborn calves. Uh, so they had tagged, tagged one of them and then moved down about 100 yards away. And the dog that was with them started freaking out and uh, sort of started running away from where they had come. But 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 obviously there was something happening behind them. They turned around and they could see this mother cow running around in a frantic way. So they came back and found that the um, that the calf that they had just tagged was completely, um, you know, all of its body cavity had been removed. It was lying on the grass. And it was honestly the weirdest thing that I've ever seen because it was this obvious newborn calf that was lying sort of with his four legs sort of stretched on the grass um, um, with uh, the big plastic tag of on the ear had been sliced off cleanly with obviously what looked like a scalpel. I mean, it certainly wasn't a coyote attack or anything like that. It was obviously some a really sharp instrument. And then at the same time, a completely empty body cavity and not a drop of blood. That was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Because normally, if a predator attacks even an 84-pound calf, there's going to be at least a couple of liters of blood and guts flying all all around the place. This was a very, very pristine scene. And remember, this had happened in daylight um, with two people only 100 yards away. They didn't hear anything. They didn't see anything. It, it, It was an obvious setup. You know, it was it was perfectly lying spread eagle on the grass as if it had been placed there in a sort of a ritualistic way. That calf was a real gut punch because, you know, it was that combination of ferocity and finesse. I should add, uh, you know, although I am kryptonite when it comes to UFOs and when I'm there, they don't appear. Uh, that my role as a journalist was to gather information. So in all of my trips there, I would interview the people like Column, like Eric Davis, who had spent a lot of time on the ranch, as well as the neighbors. People lived around the property, the, the Ute tribe, uh, the, the whole area uh, the, where the ranch is, is a, an island of privately owned land. And the rest of it around the, on all sides is owned by the Ute tribe. So the Utes had been there for generations. They had some great stories about experiences they've had other ranchers, police officers who had worked on the property. I gathered a lot of information and the stories were incredibly spooky. Since we're talking about occurrences on the ranch um, and your your guys' great book, it, it covers everything from cryptid sightings to UFO UAP sightings to portals to poltergeist activity. Um, was there anything, were, were there any occurrences on the ranch that didn't make it into uh, Hunt for the Skinwalker? that are worth talking about or that you're allowed to talk about? We debated about a couple of them because there's a couple of things that are really just off the charts crazy. It, it makes no sense. They don't fit as a UFO story. They're not, they don't fit like a poltergeist story. They're not creature sightings exactly. They're just in a category all their own. 
and they would never happen again. Nothing ever happened quite the same. So, hmm. you know, when you're trying to be a scientist, as Colum is, and replicate uh, results, it's impossible. But the, the one that we really debated about was um, there's a, a report that that Colum and his team acquired from two Native American police officers. They drove down the road. There's a paved road leads to the dirt road that goes into the ranch. And they're out one, there one night in total darkness. They come around the curve on this right near where the entrance to the ranch is. And they see two figures standing on the road wearing trench coats, smoking cigarettes. Their backs are to the road. The officers shined a light over on these guys who turned around and they were dogs. They had dog faces, what? dog faces, smoking cigarettes, wearing trench coats in the middle of the night. Looked at each other then looked back. The guys are gone. They get out of the car. There were burning cigarettes there on, on the road. But, you know, at the time we kind of debated, do we put that in my meat? Does it destroy the credibility of everything else? Because it's so off the charts weird. But as you know, if you follow these topics now, there are a lot of dogmen sightings all across the country. It's right. not as crazy yeah. as it might have sounded then. We decided not to edit ourselves. Go ahead and put it in and let people judge it for what it is. Yeah, that was definitely the weirdest, uh, the weirdest one. I, I, I think the, the sort of the broad spectrum of everything from Bigfoot sightings to these gigantic uh, dire wolves that were seen multiple times. The Uinta Basin itself, you know, this sort of 40 square mile area has had a long, long history of UFO activity, uh, which is as what was well documented by Professor Salisbury. But it's the weird underbelly that we sort of were kept on, you know, bumping up against. In addition to the sort of the shiny uh, metallic objects, you would also find these uh, a lot of these accounts of these bizarre creatures and and also bizarre sort of these large bird like pterodactyl creatures um, that that were encountered. Um, so it was a combination of straight sort of nuts and bolts kinds of UFOs and these bizarre creatures mixed in with cattle mutilations. And then sort of all these strange things used to happen on the property. All the weird little stuff that was going on that's chronicled in an amazing document that the NIDS guys put together. That's what raises the hair on, on, on my arms when I read about it and when I hear about it from the people to whom who experienced it. So what other impacts and ramifications have you seen as a result for you publishing Hunt for the Skinwalker? You know, when we published the book all the way back in 2005, which seems like ancient history, George had published two articles just prior to the book that were they went global about this path of the Skinwalker. Um, but that was the first sort of inkling that anybody had had known about this this property. I would say uh, a, an entirely new meme or cultural meme has been generated because of that book and the way it sort of uh, you know kept on rolling over the years. It's generated sort of movies and documentaries. There's probably between half a dozen and a dozen sort of books. Um, there, and the TV show that uh, uh, has been ongoing for the last four years, I mean, all of these can be sort of uh, seen as the products of that original Hunt for the Skinwalker book, because, you know, nobody would have had an interest or even a knowledge. Boom Studios is putting out uh, Hunt for the Skinwalker in comic book form, which will be collected into graphic novel, which... Uh, as as of this recording, uh, we have just launched the uh, deluxe pre-order campaign for it, our uh, Boom Direct Reserve campaign uh, for Hunt for the Skinwalker. And included in that is what we're calling the declassified edition of uh, the original uh, publication of, of your book. Um, so I was just wondering if uh, the two of you could talk a little bit about what is so special about this version um, of the book, both the graphic novel adaptation and the new updated declassified edition of the uh, nonfiction book. Well, we're excited about the possibilities of a new generation of readers uh, through a graphic novel comic uh, platform discovering the story, the story that kind of started it all. Um, I, you know, as a kid, I had hundreds of these comics and, and loved it. I learned my vocabulary from comics, Marvel and DC. I wish the hell I had saved all those things from of the first edition <laughs> of Spider-Man and Thor and the Fantastic Four and 
And um, I wish I had kept on kept that collection, but uh, I've been a comic fan for a long time. Obviously, it's a chance to reach a, a much broader spectrum of readers. We're, we're thrilled to, to be part of this. We're, we can't wait to see where it goes. And of course, we're also thrilled to be able to offer a hardcover version of our book. Uh, we've, we've proposed that a couple of times to the publisher. Uh, you guys are going to make it happen, though. It's going to and uh, we're going to write an updated uh, version and add some new material to update the story from 2005 on. And and um, and hopefully a lot of new readers will learn what's what's happened at the ranch over the decades. We are all very excited. And actually, um, we we were curious, how involved were you two with our amazing, wonderful creative team of Zach Thompson and Valeria Burzo? We've been talking to them for a while, uh, for several months, about uh, the approaches that could take. They've been sharing artwork and different kind of renderings and ideas for covers with us. And we're giving thumbs up or thumbs down to all that. It's just been a lot of fun, though, to see all the different interpretations that the various artists have come up with. I love it. I'd like to make posters and put them on my wall, all of them. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's make some posters. All I've seen is uh, very, very spooky versions of, you know, dead cows and, um, you know, various creatures parading through the moonlight. I mean, they're the, I think the creativity in this project is really, really good. And I've, I've really liked a, a lot of what has been produced. Um, it's it's a, it's been a really interesting sort of creative process so far. We have some ideas, too, about extras. You know, the, your team has come up with some really cool ideas, marketing ideas for the various packages. We've got something special in mind, something that's never been published before that we're going to include Ooh. as an extra. What? Um, I'm not even going to describe it, but it, it is a, it's a chronology of events that was compiled uh, a long time ago that has never been made public. That's pretty spectacular that's fun oh, that sounds super rad that sounds so fun i love that me too we're, like, we're both like me and anthony's eyes like light up for like oh my gosh it sounds so cool before we wrap up here and again i can't thank you enough for the both of you for taking the time tonight to to speak with us this has been so much fun um as we have been discussing this entire time just succinctly in your own words what do you think is happening on the ranch and why you know, we went through in the book, Column and I went through, what are the possibilities? Uh, are there aliens, extraterrestrials? Well, I guess you can't rule it out because we don't really know are extraterrestrials visiting our planet or not, what they would look like and why they would do the things that have happened at the ranch. So we can't rule it out, but it doesn't really, uh, the activity there doesn't seem to match what we know about UFO activity around the world. Uh, could it be a military psyop operation? Well, we can't rule that out either. Some of it, uh, you know, some of the things that have happened there, you know, we have seen evidence that the military has been interested in the property. We know that the DIA had a study of it and we know other foreign governments have, have been monitoring it as well. So some of what happened there could be military psyop operation, but also there's some of that technology that no one on earth has um, could it be some other kind of intelligence, a non-human intelligence, a crypto terrestrial, ultra terrestrial, something exotic that we can't even really define? Yeah, uh, it, it could be interdimensional. Um, that's a possibility, too. We know that some of the activity that happened on the ranch, um, it, there were holes in the sky and things would move in and out as if there's another world on the other side. So um, interdimensional. I mean, there's a lot of exotic possibilities that are hard to prove. Nailing it down, what was going on on the ranch for one central source is maybe impossible. And maybe the answer is it's more than one thing. Maybe it's interdimensional and extraterrestrial and military psychological or something else more exotic. No one knows. Um, it's going to take more study. Uh, you know, it's going to take a long time to figure out if ever. The bottom line from all of the experience on Skinwalker Ranch is that Whatever is there is, number one, it's very intelligent. Number two, it's very deceptive. It has, it has a way of uh, all the time being out of reach and making sure that it's never sort of discovered. All communication happens on th its terms. So we, we tried over the years on many different uh, occasions to initiate uh, various forms of communication multiple different times. Whatever is there is very intelligent. It's very deceptive. 
And um, it, if it ever wants to communicate, I think it will, it will do so uh, in a way that will completely surprise us because I think a lot of our interpretations and of a lot, a lot of our ways of, of analyzing these things are pretty old school. And um, I think it probably requires some fresh, fresh thinking. But first of all, we've got to get more data. Mr. Bigelow, in the first interview he ever did on camera, I asked him some questions about the ranch. And he said, look, this thing is always one step ahead of us. Uh, it, it allows us to, the only things that we see are what it allows us to see. It's like a display. It's like a game. And it's always one step ahead. It knows what we're going to do before we do it. Uh, and it, it, it stays one step ahead. So whatever it is, it's a lot smarter than us. It allows us to see little glimpses of this and that, none of which ever makes sense. Um, it's going to take a breakthrough of some kind, or it will have to decide uh, when we know what's going on there. Um, unless it allows it, it's not going to happen. I wonder how it feels about you and everybody who goes on the ranch. It kind of sizes you up. Uh, you know, people who have gone there with a militant sort of attitude, folks packing a gun, I'm not afraid of this. I'm going to come in here and it's not going to scare me. They're the ones that get, get the worst treatment. They're the ones that have it. Awesome. <laughs> here's the crap. It scares the I crap love that out. though. It's like, it, it senses, it senses how you're entering its space and if you're being respectful or not. And I kind of, honestly, kind of really dig that. I'd say after I'd been there for maybe 10 times, I had to, I made an admission sitting there with Mr. Bigelow. I don't know if Colin was on that trip or not. I said, I feel good there. I, I just feel, I had a good feeling. Uh, it yeah. was scary a lot of times, but it just gave me some energy that I didn't have uh, before I got there. It just it was a, it was kind of like sticking my finger in an electric socket sometimes, but I always felt good there. So that's why it doesn't mess with you. But I guess. It seems so odd and frustrating that the only way to kind of observe and record data is to be within the dome of it itself yeah. and it has complete control over its dome so it's it's you know kind of damned if you damned if you don't trying to to record and and, and monitor anything on the ranch uh in its own domain i know maybe did you try asking nicely <laughs> yeah we did actually <laughs> of course you did yes this has been amazing, George Column. Thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. Um, to everyone who's listening or watching, be sure to pick up a copy of both issue number one of Boom's Hunt for the Skinwalker and Column and George's book. Thank you uh, all. Thank you Absolutely. So much. I'm so glad you guys were able to do this. Um, this really fast, <laughs> where can people find you in your work? I'm uh, still work at KLAS TV, so I'm... I'm you can email me, gnap at 8newsnow.com. I, I uh, post Coast to Coast AM third and fourth Sundays of each month. I do a podcast with Jeremy Corbell called Weaponized. I'm around. I'm, I'm working right now for a, um, a research institute that studies uh, scientifically, quote unquote, the uh, survival of human consciousness after death. NIS was divided in two. One arm was UFOs. The other arm was survival of consciousness after death. Well, that organization with Robert Bigelow has been reactivated three years ago. And the focus is on looking at scientifically, what is the evidence that human consciousness actually survives death? Um, and so, you know, what happens after death? Is, is consciousness capable of surviving death? And if so, how can it be uh, interacted with? How can it be communicated with? So, that's what I'm doing right now. That's fascinating. That's genuinely fascinating. That's yeah. I'm. I want to talk about that next. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Let's everyone, do if you want to stay up to date, <laughs> yeah. Everybody listening, if you want to stay up to date on all things Boom Direct, uh, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel or our podcast, and to follow Boom Studios on all of social media. Yep, I'm Harley Solbaka. and I'm Anthony Morrow, and this is and this is Boom, Boom Direct. Direct. So cool.